My friends, Mario Kart 64 is perhaps one of the most refined speed games, with continuous competition from legions of players over the last 24 years. As such, most of the tricks and shortcuts in the game were immediately discovered shortly after release. 11 of the game's 16 tracks have shortcuts in time trials mode, all of which had been known about since the 90s. However, five tracks through 2020 were still being driven as intentionally programmed by the developers many moons ago. Moomoo Moo Farm, Koopa Troopa Beach, Bowser's Castle, Banshee Boardwalk, and Sherbet Land. However, on October 1st, 2020, that all changed forever. This is the story of the discovery of the first ever shortcut on Sherbet Land after 24 years. Innovations and improvements in speedrunning are always amazing to see, but so are innovations and improvements to your daily life. Behold the Ridge Wallet, an amazing upgrade over your old, bulky, unoptimized wallet. The Ridge Wallet is light, sleek, industrial, and fits perfectly in my front pocket. Its slim profile never gets in the way when I sit down to game and go for epic world records. And I know, I see the comments saying, who keeps their wallet in their front pocket? But I do, and the Ridge Wallet does fit just as well in your back pocket too. Ridge has a ton of cool styles you can choose from. They're super durable and have a lifetime warranty. It can hold up to 12 cards, plus room for cashola, since if you're old school like me, cash is still king. And they have over 30,000 five-star reviews, which is pretty insane. You can get 10% off today with free worldwide shipping and returns by going to ridge.com slash stay true. That's ridge.com slash stay true and use my code stay true. Link in description. Thanks. Sherbet Land, one of the comfier courses with an absolute banger of a soundtrack. Drive around, avoid falling in the frozen lake, evade the sliding penguins, pretty basic stuff. It's pretty simple to see why this course has no shortcuts, as there are no real points where the track overlaps on itself, nor any close areas where you can jump from one part of the track to another. These small jumps over the cracks and corners aren't considered shortcuts as, I mean, it's really just playing the game as intended. Any optimal minded player would have played that way. There have definitely been shortcuts or tricks discovered in the Grand Prix mode using a multitude of items and CPU racers for trickery. And it's pretty cool, but it's not. Time Trials, where most of the competition in Mario Kart 64 has taken place over the past two decades. So what changed? Well, in two words, or maybe three words, Forest 64. On October 1st, Forrest shared a nine minute video explaining the new shortcut discovery he had just made on Sherbet Land, the first ever in the history of the course. In it, he describes this pivotal wall of ice, the centerpiece to the new trick. Well, these penguins are integral to the trick as well. You see, if you shroom into a penguin, you'll sometimes then bounce off them. And this bounce has many interesting properties, including that while bouncing off a penguin, you can pass through walls you usually wouldn't fall through. Pretty amazing. But usually when you fall out of bounds in Mario Kart 64, you get placed back on the track by Lakitu, fairly close to where you left the track. And this can indeed be the case when you bounce off this penguin through this wall. However, 
not always. Because this ice wall has some sort of magical properties. But before getting to the magical ice wall properties, we need to discuss some overarching properties on the Sherbet Land course. Take a look at this. See how when jumping over some cracks, the progress view stops and then jumps ahead to catch up? A similar thing happens when you reverse on this point of the track, or when you drive around the other side of this large blue rock. These are what we'd call a section jump. Well, what does that mean exactly? Well, to understand section jumps, first we need to understand two things. Sections and path markers. We'll start with sections. The courses in Mario Kart 64 are basically divided into grander sections, or what you might call rooms in other games. Most courses have roughly 20 sections, but some courses have more or fewer. And these are defined areas on the track, important to the logic of the game. Just imagine the track being cut into roughly 20 fairly equal parts. The game does this to help decide what parts to load when looking certain directions, to decide where to place you back on the track when you fall off, you know, typical game logic stuff. This is a map I drove Luigi Raceway. I literally made up this section so I don't actually use these for real, but it's a demonstration you can get a general gist of sections and what they represent in the game, just segments of the track which are assigned and labeled. Okay, so now path markers. Check out this view of your path markers as you move around a course in Mario Kart 64. Every frame, the game checks to see how you're progressing in relation to these path markers. In this example, the red dot would be your cart. The green dot is the most closely associated path marker, and the blue ones are all the path markers ahead or behind. You can see the path markers literally run around the center of the track. Imagine the path a blue shell takes around the course, or the path your camera takes around the course in the results screen after finishing a race. These follow the path markers. Now, when driving every frame, the game wants to check the 10 path markers around you to update your position. It'll normally check the six path markers ahead of you, the three behind you, and the one you're on every frame. Driving normally, this will be fine as you're unlikely to jump ahead seven or more path markers or jump behind four or more path markers in a single one frame window. However, if you do manage to progress more than that distance in one frame, the game gets surprised by this and writes a section jump into its memory, storing which section or part of the track you were on when this event happened. Now, because Sherbet Land is so wide at points, there are a number of places where, by cutting corners or moving in a certain way, your closest path marker will be a large difference of more than the 10 the game expects frame to frame, meaning you'll often get section jumps. Right in this spot, it's like, you know, which path marker are you closest to? It's pretty ambiguous. And that's what you're seeing here on the progress view, the game getting confused and adjusting for this jump in relation to the path markers. Okay, keep all that in mind. Now, let's get back to the magical ice wall. Well, for one, despite this looking like a wall, the game interprets this wall as actually a floor. Okay, I know this whole thing is already starting to sound ridiculous, but yes, keep following along. This is a floor, and this means you can drive on it, or at least jump up it a little bit. Other walls which aren't floors, you'll just fall right off. You can't even jump up twice on walls. But this specific wall floor is a floor, so you can jump up on it. You might also know that some walls on Chaco Mountain, for example, act the same way. So that's all one piece of this puzzle. Furthermore, these walls on Sherbet Land, or rather floors pretending to be walls, don't have sections mapped to them. This wall floor should be in section 7 of the track, but it's actually undefined. Now, remember when we did a section jump up here? This section jump value gets stored in the game's memory if you perform one, and because the wall doesn't have a section value mapped to it, the section of the section jump value gets overwritten onto this wall. Isn't that amazing? 
So what happens in simple terms is that if you pull off this section jump over here, then you drive around the course and jump onto this wall, the game will actually think your way over here beyond the outside of the cave. Absolutely insane. Oh, but it gets even more insane. You have to be pretty careful though, as the moment you fall off the wall floor, the game loses the section jump overwrite and no longer thinks you're on the other side. However, and this is where the penguin comes in, if you bounce off the penguin through this section of wall with the section jump overwrite in place, bingo bango, the game thinks you're on the other side of the cave and thus Lakitu places you there outside the cave. The first ever shortcut on Sherbet Land. Truly remarkable. <laughs> All right, so that was pretty convoluted, but well worth it, right? Guess how much time we just saved on a fast lap time using this incredible cave skip shortcut? 10, 20, 30 seconds? Nope, it's actually about two to three seconds. Yeah, all that for two or three seconds, if done perfectly. But it's honestly a cool as heck shortcut, and so the race for world records was on. The non-shortcut fast lap record on the course is 37.75 by Danny B, and so a race erupted to beat the time using the new trick. Christian C would be the first to document such a run with a time of 37.44, or 31.14 on NTSC, but 10 more records would be exchanged by five other carters down to this 35.09 by Jaden one day later. So yeah, just under three seconds saved. I actually think this shortcut is really, really cool for that reason, because it means you already have to be a very skilled Mario Kart 64 player to have a chance at getting a world record time, even with this shortcut. I mean, you have to be skilled to get any world record, but this one requires a lot of classic driving skill. And there's a good chance you could hit this and still not save any time with it, if your driving was imperfect or the trick was slow. I drove this run where I hit it twice in three laps and still ended up 43 seconds off world record, so you get the point. In any matter, all that fervent chaos and the mad rush of world record pursuit went on for one day, because then Forest64 dropped this video. Okay then, what the heck is this? Well, I'll do my best to explain, and honestly, this, this one, <laughs> this one is even more convoluted and insane, so buckle up. I will say I recommend watching this one hour, 10 minute video from Weatherton, Forrest himself, and Abney, digging into full detail on how this all works, if you really want to know more. So, here goes. The finish line is a crazy thing. In a way, it extends infinitely right and left, which is why you can cross the line and end the race even if you're flying off into the water on the left side of the line. However, if it truly extended infinitely, you would lose a lap as you cross this section of track on the other side, right? You'd be crossing backwards over the line. So the line has to be programmed to only be active if you're close enough to it. In this case, that's within about 20 path markers of the line. Of course, if you're way over here in the water, your closest path marker is still going to be one near the line, so the finish line will still be active. Now check this out. This wall here is actually a wall floor, like the other magical ice wall, and thus it also has no section mapped to it. Ah uh, yes, so what if we could store a section that could trick the game into thinking we were not near the finish line, and then jump up on this wall and do some funny business with it? All right, sounds like a plan. So how are we gonna do this? 
Well, one good way to mess up the game's section checks is to get more than 500 units away from the nearest path marker. That's pretty far away. And if you get there, the game will freak out and try to find a path marker within a thousand units, and it'll write that into your memory as your section jump. Now, by zooming off into the lake, you can get about 200-ish units away from the path markers. Not quite far enough. So how can we get even further? Ah, uh, yes, once again, the penguin is the secret. So if you bounce off the penguin, you can get kicked out of bounds, just like in the previous shortcut. However, one bounce isn't quite far enough. What about a double bounce? The bounce speed values stack up, so this does push you even further than just one single bounce. And it is decent, but it still doesn't quite make it to the 500 unit distance to trick the game into miswriting your jump section value, because you fall into this out of bounds void water. But is there a way to skim across the top of the water to get even more distance? A crazy thought, but yes, there is, using what's called the Lakitu effect. You see, if you fall off the course and get picked up by Lakitu, he can't pick you back up for a handful of frames. Notice the first time I zoom into the water right here, he picks me up right away. But the second time I do it, the camera basically sits there for a couple moments, waiting for Lakitu to come back. So, if you back up off the course here, get replaced on the track by Lakitu here, then do the double penguin bounce, you'll notice the carter skimming across the top of the water for a few frames. This technique gets us a little bit further, just far enough to get 500 units away from the nearest path markers. And ergo, the game writes a section jump value, specifically for section 2, into our memory. Okie dokie, so what does that mean? What can we do with this? Well, now we're gonna go do some finish line magic. Let's drive back here near the finish line. Now, Mario Kart 64 displays the game in 30 frames per second, but it processes its logic in 60 frames per second. Is it possible for us to move quickly enough where we're on one side of the finish line on one frame and then on the mismapped magical ice wall on the next frame? It seems like this might be a pipe dream because the wall doesn't extend far enough beyond the finish line. However, with a well-timed mushroom at the correct angle, this act of speedrun sorcery is indeed real. Let's take a look at this 2378, the first ever fast lap world record with this strategy performed by Smurfy on October 3rd. So first we see driving to this area of the course within section 2, then reversing into the lake. We replace on the lack by Lakitu, now the Lakitu effect is in place, so we double shroom off the penguin, get bounced way far out of bounds. Great, now the game has given us a section jump to section 2. Now we drive all the way around the track to the finish line, but don't quite cross it yet. We're still on lap 1 here. Now through a series of precise setups, Smurfy crosses the line, entering lap 2 while going to the lake. This isn't necessary, but helps with the next setup. Now we patiently align Toad at the perfect angle, shroom away, and on this frame, we're still in lap 2, barely in front of the finish line, not having crossed it backwards yet. And on this frame, we're on the magical ice wall, the game thinking we're in section 2, thus the finish line is not actively loaded. The game did not detect that we crossed the finish line backwards, and thus did not deduct a lap from us. The result of this is that, well, now we're at the end of lap two. And so when we cross the finish line again, bingo, bango, bongo, new world record. Absolutely insane. Absolute madness. Truly stunning. This would then set off another gold rush, where Abney would lower the record three times in a single session. But then, Smurfy would go for the even more insane TAS-like setup. In this, you set up the initial part of the shortcut the same way, double, penguin, bounce and all, but now you're going to attempt an AB spin around the finish line where again, on one frame, you're not yet crossed back over the line, and on the subsequent frame, you've jumped onto the magical ice wall, 
tricking the game into deactivating the finish line by thinking you're in section 2. Doing the precise AB spin at full speed is extremely difficult. Some say it's even harder than hitting a single weather tanko. So yeah, not a walk in the park. However, on that day, October 4th, Smurfy, Abney, VAJ, and IMath2 would all lower the record until Abney hit a 216, which is where the record remains now, nearly a month later. Truly and utterly remarkable. 16, dude, that's better than anything I did with saves. All right, so that was my layman's explanation of why and how these shortcuts work and the current state of these world records as the strategies to progressed. Like I mentioned, go ahead and watch the longer explanation from Weatherton, Force, and Abney if you want to dig in even more into what makes us all tick. And big shoutouts to that too, because I wouldn't have been able to make sense of this shortcut without their technical prowess and willingness to share it with the world. And I mean, you know, they did discover the whole thing and all, so that's pretty cool as well. But there's something we haven't gotten to yet. What of the state of the three lap record? Given the extensive setups that take place, is it even clear that this saves time in a three lap scenario? Well, it definitely does, because remember, the section two jump is still stored as the value for this magical ice wall to interpret. So you can do the setup, then go and pull off the insane AB spin trick twice or even thrice to get a super fast time. This TAS by Weatherton shows completing the course in a mere 35 seconds. A full minute faster than the non-shortcut world record. So there is a ton of potential there. However, as mentioned earlier, getting a run like this might be more difficult than even the triple Weather Tenko Chaco Mountain run, something only two people have ever pulled off. So we might be waiting a while to see a Sherbet Land run in the 30 or 40 second range. But that's still a ton of time to cut off on the three lap shortcut time, right? Well, incredibly, there's only been one three lap run played using one of these shortcuts, which was faster than the non shortcut three lap time. This beautiful 15470 by Danny B, a mere 0.49 seconds faster than his own non shortcut three lap world record. Yes! You see, Dan plays out lap 1 as usual, then he has to do the section jump setup on lap 2, which has been slightly optimized to this movement you see here. Then on lap 3, he has to clutch the bounce into the penguin to get the Lakadu placement outside the cave, thus saving a little bit of time, and plays with the rest of the lap 3 for a time of 154.70. The 3 lap situation is complicated even further because you need these penguins to be in the right place at the right time through to quickly bounce into one of them to perform the cave skip trick. This is why Dan chooses to go for this on lap 3 instead of lap 2. You can see the penguin timing wouldn't be quite as ideal in lap 2. The penguin's movement towards the cave is just a little bit earlier before he'd be able to make it. So yeah, all of that shortcutting for a 0.49 second time save. Lower is certainly possible with this strategy, but not by much and pulling off the trick twice on laps two and three might not even save time, again because of the timing of the penguin's slides. I just think that all this chaos to save a mere half a second is super cool, pun definitely intended. It's just so unique when compared to other shortcuts which save a lot more time on the other courses in the game. But alas, this too will not last, and someone will inevitably pull off the more difficult AB spin finish line shenanigans and get a much lower three lap record in due time. So if you enjoyed this story of the discovery of Sherbet Land's first ever shortcut, be sure you're subscribed with the notification bell on because there's definitely more to come. In fact, um, uh, oh. Yeah, okay. We're gonna get to all that real soon in another video, but that's all the time we have for now in this one. So thank you all for watching, stay true, and I'll see you in the next stream or video.